The Holy, Chapter 4. The next morning, Howard spent in moral turmoil, alternately cracking his knuckles at the desk and staring brutally down at the traffic on the Lawrence Avenue. Though never a ditherer, under ordinary circumstances, he had an almost superstitious dread of melding with fate, of making decisions that would alter the course of his own life. He preferred to see himself as being swept along in an irresistible tide of events, as when the army took him in 1950, as when he opened the agency with Simon, as when he kept the agency going year after year following Simon's defection. Now he was in a stew, because a cross curtain had appeared in the tide to baffle his footsteps. Fate had sent him sent in his way a job that would give him a finger hold on the future, and that was all good and well but it was a job he could only accept at the expense of his self-respect. In spite of his glib talk about having a place to start, Howard knew he could not, o could not only earn Aaron's 50,000 by fraud. Howard knew he could only earn Aaron's 50,000 by fraud. Find out whether the ancient gods of the Middle East are still around. <laughs> Aaron might as well have asked him to find out whether cheaters ever prosper or whether love makers, or that whether love makes the world go round. It wasn't even laughable. If he took on the job, he wouldn't be looking for an answer to Aaron's question. He would be looking for something that could be tricked up to look like the answer. Something so, so much like an answer that the old man would cheerfully cough up that fee. And was that how he wanted to end his career as an outright con man? Strangely enough, when he got around to asking himself this melodramatic question, Howard smiled and his turmoil subsided because he realized he was doing something he'd often yelled at Ada for. He was creating a crisis by preparing for a crisis. He was pressing for a decision before a decision was needed. Aaron had suggested he spend a month looking the problem over. Well, why not? He was 99% sure that a month's work wouldn't change the situation, but he couldn't undertake it with a complete honest and pocket Aaron's retainer without a qualm. And who knows, maybe after a month in the water, he'd have a better sense of which way the tide was flowing. All hesitancy gone now, he pulled over a card file, looked up an old friend's number, and called to invite him to an expense account lunch at the Sheraton. Are you getting or giving? Oh, that wasn't him. Are you getting or giving? His friend wanted to know. Getting, of course. Do people buy you lunch to give? Every day, son. Sometimes twice a day. Hayes Peterson was a long, was a leg man for a columnist at the Chicago Tribune, and he had almost as many names in his head as the telephone directory. God, you're ugly, said Howard. He said as Howard slid, oh, excuse me, once again. <clears throat> God, you're ugly, he said as Howard slid into the booth across from him. I keep forgetting, between times, the gray cells iron out all those crags and gullies and scars. I know, Howard said. I do it to myself. Until I actually look at myself in the mirror, I get to thinking I'm a pretty good looking guy. <laughs> From when I was a kid. Club soda with lime, he told the waitress, who paused at their table. Hayes Peterson held up a finger for another martini. He was as he was in his mid fifties, a perfectly round little man who carried his extra weight with complete a plume, helped by a tailor who knew his craft. He had a cherub's pink face, a rosebud smile, and a tongue that could tear the flesh off the living bones. So what are you after? He asked af after they'd gossiped for a few minutes. A name, maybe. Maybe? Maybe. You don't have such a name. The little man sneered at this improbability. <laughs> Go on. A few years ago, your man did a story about a psychic fair held at that shopping center at Broadway in Diversity. I'd like an inn to that scene. Hayes looked at him with distaste. You, you want an inn to the psychic scene? I think I do. It's a place to start. So what name do you want? The name of someone I can talk to, someone who will level with me, someone who can maybe give me a useful steer. Christ, <laughs> you don't want much, do you? Yeah. These, all, these are all kooks and con artists, you know? Howard shrugged. That's why I said maybe you don't have such a name. Don't pull that bullshit snore sh trick on me, Howard. I can give you a name, okay? She's not a con artist, and I don't think she's a crook. But she's also not that far into the scene. Anything better than what I've got right now. And besides lunch, what am I supposed to get out of this deal? What do you need, Ace? 
I'm on call. You got my number. You want something looked up in Uptown? Yuck. Is there a human life in Uptown? Traces of it. Fuck it, Howard. Shove it up your ass. Her name is Denise Purcell. Smiling, Howard jotted in his notebook. And what does she do? Does she claim to be a psychic? No, that's the thing. She doesn't pretend to be to be Madame Carlotta. She, she does tarot readings, very straight, very matter of fact. I watched her work, talked to her for a while, and she impressed me. No big come on, no mystical vomit. Sounds good. Do you think I should offer to pay her for her time? I'd say no offhand, but that's not guaranteed. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of the tarot card readers? He glanced at his wrist. Come on, let's order. I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta, gotta meet a guy at our Ricardo's in 45 minutes. The doorman at the South Side condominium was obviously reluctant to pass Howard in, but there wasn't much he could do about it after he confirmed that he was expected. Howard wondered if this was a reaction to his appearance or special protectiveness, Miss Purcell insisted. Ascending to the 18th floor, he decided it was the latter. He'd already formed an image of her, a wispy creature full of hesitant, mousy gestures. And because of this, he would have walked right past the woman standing outside the elevator if she hadn't stopped him with a... Mr. Schmeen. He paused and looked down at the slender, self-possessed woman of about 40, handsome rather than pretty, in a smart tweed suit he felt sure she hadn't put on for his benefit. She was examining him with a grave, competent look, as if he were a statue she was thinking of buying. He understood immediately why Hayes Peterson had been impressed. I wasn't born with this face, he said. She smiled politely. Carl, the doorman, I thought I should have a look before letting you in. Always a good policy. Come on in. She led him into the apartment that reminded him of an impressionist painting full of light, color, plants, blossoms. It was cheerful and feminine, but not oppressively so. They sat down from, from each other, and he felt a twinge of disappointment when he realized she wasn't going to make the usual social gesture of offering coffee. And now, how may I help you, Mr. Sheem? Ah, he said vaguely. He wished there was an opening more graceful than the simple, inelegant plunge, but after nearly 40 years of his, as an investigator, he had yet to find it. This is my situation, Miss Purcell. A client has asked me to look into something for him to find an answer to a question he has. I won't try to judge the usefulness of the question, but it's one that, for an investigator, is a little hard to come by the grips with, to say the least. She nodded, just as if he'd said something that made sense. At this point, to be completely not honest, I'm not even looking for an answer to the question. I'm just looking for a place to start. On the phone, you mentioned a psychic fair I did in 1989. Does that have some connection to this? Well, it does and it doesn't. At this point, I can't be sure. Howard felt like a burglar trying to pick a lock with a feather. But what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm right at the beginning, just poking around, and my first thought was to have a look inside the world that psychic fair represents. I think you have a misrepresentation about that, Mr. Sheen. There is no world there. There's just a bunch of people shooting off in all directions, pursuing their own individual interests. It has no more coherence than at a flea market, really. Go on. Well, at one table you have a chronologist or palm reader. At the other you have people painting mandalas, passing our Rosicrucian literature, casting horoscopes, doing curling photography, selling stuff, body oils, incense, cult books, biofeedback gadgets. What does that, what does that all add up to, Miss, Mr. Or what does that all add up to, Mr. Sheem? Yeah, I see what you mean. Howard sat blinking at her for a few minutes. Maybe I'd better just tell you what it is that my client is after. All right. I make no apologies for it. I don't say it makes good sense. It's just what it is, okay? Okay. Do you know the Old Testament, Miss Purcell? Her eyes widened impressively. I suppose I've read it half a dozen times over the years. Then you know a lot better than I do. In outline, the Jews, the Israelites, were ultimately rejected by God because they were unfaithful, because they preferred to worship the gods of their neighbors worshipped, Baal and Azeroth and Moloch and that lot. She nodded. Okay, my client wants to know something about these gods. He wants to know what made them so much more attractive than the gods of Israel. She studied him with disapproval for a moment. You're choking. Frankly, that's what I said to him myself. Maybe if you heard him explain it, it would sound more reasonable. It isn't that the question itself is ridiculous. It's that a, per 
private detective. Howard nodded. Again, I said this very same thing to him, Miss Purcell. What you have to understand is that he's not looking for the stories. He's not looking for what the theologians or historians might say. He's looking for what can be found out about the ex an experienced investigator. He wants me to approach this the same way I'd approach any other case. <laughs> Good heavens. And you've taken it on. I haven't exactly taken it yet. I'm trying to find out whether there's anything there to take on. I see. Her brows came together in a frown. But why on earth are you talking to me? Howard sighed. He wasn't sure whether it was from relief or exasperation. What he needed was a nerve to grope Miss Purcell's. What he needed was a nerve to grope for Miss Purcell's. Uh, for Miss Purcell, it's been said that with the right three introductions, you can reach anyone in the world. A president, a king, anyone. I've reached you with one introduction. You may not be able to help me directly, but maybe you'll be able to help me. Help give me another introduction. An introduction to someone you think might be able to help me. And if this person can't help me, maybe he can give me an introduction to someone else. Maybe I don't know exactly who I'm looking for. It may take five introductions or a dozen. To reach whom, Mr. Sheen? Who is this ultimate person you want to find? As I say, I don't know. There may not even be such a person. But what would he do for you if you found him? Again, I honestly don't know, Miss Purcell. Sometimes this is the only way an investigation can operate. Sometimes you don't know what you're looking for. All you know is how to go about finding it. Do you see what I mean? Denise Purcell had stopped listening some time back, and Howard waited for her to catch up. When she did, she went very still, and the blood drained from her face. I've been naive, haven't I? What do you mean? Her eyes glinted with an icy fury. You came here thinking I would hook you up with some miserable coven of devil worshippers, didn't you? Believe me, I didn't, Howard said earnestly. What else would it be? You're not stupid, Mr. Sheen. I'm sure you know perfectly well that these old gods were, or are. In ancient times, people called them gods. In modern times, they call them demons. Baal is still Baal. Azeroth is still Azeroth. And Moloch is still Moloch. The only difference is that people worship them as devils instead of gods. Yes, that's true, Miss Purcell. I knew that. But believe me, if you handed me the name or an address of a group of devil worshippers, I'd throw it in the trash. Why? Why? He looked around helplessly. Because I'd assume... They were a bunch of screwballs. That's why. What am I going to find out from screwballs? That's in there. That's in the first place. Go on. In the second place. Sure. I know there are devil worshippers in Chicago. I read the newspapers, Miss Purcell. I watch the talk shows. So what do these folks do at the meetings? Hold black masses? Mutilate hosts they've snitched at the communion rail? spit on crucifixes. This has nothing to do with what was going on in Israel 2,500 years ago, does it? No. Then why would I want to get hooked up with them, for God's sake? Denise Parcel closed her eyes and looked as if she was resisting the temptation to nod her lower lip. Finally, she nodded, contritely. I apologize, Mr. Sheen. I really do. I jumped to a conclusion there. Well, it's understandable, Howard conceded gravely. I also underestimated you. That too, he said, and and astonished himself by adding, so how about a cup of coffee? She laughed, relieved, and headed for the kitchen. It was one of those moments when he missed Ada Badly, leading Denise Purcell up to that little misunderstanding had been as tricky as move as he'd ever made, and he had no one to share it with. When there's ice to be broken, make the ice maker break it. It was broken now. Thanks for listening.